Good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here at the Games for Change Asia Pacific Festival. And I'd like today I'd like to share a talk with you called the Rosetta Wheel, a framework for designing behaviour change games. So my name is Dr. Jane Cox. And I'll just um, intro just very briefly. I wear a number of hats. Um, so I'm a researcher in the areas of psychology and behavioural science. Um, and that's kind of my background. Um, so I've got a Bachelor of Behavioural Science. Um, I did psychology honours and I recently completed my PhD. I'm a university tutor in um, postgraduate psychology subjects. I'm also a mental health clinician working towards future registration as a psychologist, uh, a digital communicator and a um, bit of a game designer as well. And so today I'd like to share a little bit about what my PhD thesis is, was about, which is about the intersection of um, psychology and game design. But before I get into that, <clears throat> I'll just give a bit of an overview of what I'll talk about today. So I'll give a brief overview of the research background. So how is this framework for design actually developed? Um, then I'll talk about the framework itself and the different components. And then I'll just share an example of a recent game that I was involved in designing for the Games for Change Festival in New York, actually. Um, and that'll be how we can apply the Rosetta Wheel in practice. So let's start with why though, why psychology and game design? Um, I believe that our world is changing and interactive technologies have become an integral part of the fabric of our reality. Um, games are a perfect medium for creating joyful and meaningful experiences, helping us to change and find our best selves in a lot of cases from watches that remind us to stop and take a breather, or zombies on our phones for keeping us fit, to swimming deep in the ocean and VR to learn relaxation. I believe games hold a valuable key in helping people unlock positive change within themselves. And as Brenda Romero says here, games are capable of a higher form of communication, one which actively engages the participant and makes them a part of the experience rather than just a passive observer. The future holds exciting possibilities with creating technologies for positive change, but there's work to do. So there's disciplines to integrate and a shared language to unlock. And so <clears throat> along with that comes new methods as well. Um, and it was my goal that my PhD work on the Rosetta Wheel Framework represents a small piece of that work. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the theoretical foundation of this work integrates psychology, which is all about understanding and changing behaviour, using, um, reflecting on theories such as the social cognitive theory by Bandura and the trans-theoretical model of behaviour change by Prochaska and Di Clementi. I'll go into a little bit more detail about that model in just a moment. As well as game design, so serious game design in particular, designing engaging games for change using game design patterns by Bjork and Holopainen and the Serious Game Design Assessment Framework, which was also used in this research, along with game design practice. So this is a really young field and there isn't a tremendous amount of um, theoretical background research in game design yet, really only kind of a couple of decades, which is young for an academic field. So all of the amazing stuff happening out there is happening in practical world. So it's happening with actual practitioners, game designers. So they were an important part of this research as well. So let's talk a little bit about the psychology aspect of this um, theoretical foundation. And I'll start with talking about how behaviour is actually a bit like soup. How? <laughs> well, there's lots of different ingredients that go into making soup. And so, <clears throat> you know, when you're thinking about behaviour as something that you'd like to address or change, think of it like soup. You don't want to necessarily add different soup on top of the soup. You actually need to work out 
well, what are the ingredients and how can we actually identify what's going on here? So where there's different potatoes and garlic and maybe chicken and things like that, maybe you want the soup to be a little bit spicier, in which case you need to adapt and change one, one or two ingredients. It's the same with behaviour. We've got moods, we've got our... Um, you know, our DNA, our thoughts, our attitudes, our motivations, we've got our schemas, all of these things inform at an individual level what comes out as behaviour. And that's not even talking about environmental impacts and things like that as well, which also have an impact on our behaviour. So these things are really important to consider when you're talking about changing behaviour. Um, as we'll talk about next, because it's a process. So this theory, the trans-theoretical model of behaviour change, is one of the main foundational theories that kind of drove this research. And it essentially posits that behaviour change is a process um, that goes through these five kind of broad stages, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and then maintenance. So behaviour change doesn't actually occur until this fourth stage, the action stage. Um, there's a lot of cognitive and emotional work that's happening in the lead up to any visible or actual change. And so this is really important to consider um, when you're looking at things like gamification, for example, which are models and theories that are based on um, activating specific behaviours with rewards and incentives and kind of reinforcement schemes, whereas this framework is kind of based on doing a lot of this cognitive, emotive work up front because when you're looking at long-term behaviour change, you really need to have full knowledge and um, so there's consciousness raising. This means that you're increasing awareness of information and education and personal feedback um, and dramatic relief. That's the emotive component. So you're actually engaging someone on an emotional level. So, um, yeah, this is the one of the foundations of the Rosetta Wheel is this process-driven model of behaviour change. And we've also got a foundation in game design and actually having a look at the different components of game design according to the Game Design Pattern Collection by Bjork and Holopainen. And they created, they wrote a book in 2004. It has 11 categories, six of which are pictured here. So it wasn't just focused on these six. Um, these are just examples of um, kind of key um, pattern categories um, that came up in the research. Has 37 subcategories and 241 design patterns in all. And I know that there's kind of ongoing work on this model to kind of flesh this out as well. So this was a big part of the research as well. So let's go over to the research overview which is essentially study one is mapping the matrix and I asked the question what elements of health behavior change games foster these psychological processes of change so having a look and analyzing specific games for well, how can we kind of break this down and understand how it's linked to these psychological processes of change so that was an analytic study that I conducted and then the second one is designing for change which asks the question how do designers approach the design of behavior change um, and I interviewed a number of expert game designers who are all experts in their field globally having designed games for change before and um, asked them about it and asked them to link you know their practice to um, yeah, to, to game design techniques and how they link them to actual behaviour change techniques. And then I did this synthesis and brought all of that data together to understand how we can do it in practice and whether there was a framework to this. And what happened next looked a little bit like this. <laughs> so I pulled all the pieces together and eventually came up with the framework, which is the Rosetta Wheel. And this is the kind of core part 
of the Rosetta Whittle framework. And it has 10 change keys, as you can see, kind of going round from 12 o'clock through right round to change key 10 at the top, which is, um, yeah, all going around these five pro five main stages of change and the 10 main psychological processes of change. So that very inner wheel are the five stages of change. And then the second wheel with consciousness raising, dramatic relief, they're all the 10 psychological processes of change. And then that third wheel, that's the Rosetta wheel. So that's where um, I've linked in the psychological processes with the game design processes and come up with the 10 change keys, which I'll just outline a little bit more detail here. Um, so we've got informative experiences. This is all about increasing awareness with information and education. Then there's emotion engagement. Uh, which is all about engaging emotions through experiences. And we've got social reflection, which is a really powerful agent of change where we actually get to take the perspective of another. Observing support, observing how things feel differently in different perspectives and different representations and noticing that social support, which then gives rise to an introspective shift which is all about creating a new self-image, a new heightened self-efficacy. And transforming belief is kind of making a commitment to that renewed self-efficacy. Developing substitution is all about developing and experimenting with new behaviours and new capabilities. Supportive communication is about finding supportive connections. And this can be within game or it can be, you know, externally in terms of a game community. Rewarding choices, which is all about meeting goals and uh, receiving rewards for this. So this is kind of along the lines of that traditional gamification model. But as you can see, there's been a lot of cognitive, emotional and motivational change that has needed to precede that before any of these rewards actually are meaningful. And then there's intentional integration, which is all about managing yourself and your environment in an ongoing way. And this is just a bit of a more detailed view of change key one, which is inf informative experiences. And so what we've got, what I've got for each of the change keys is the name of the key is a bit of a distilled reflection of what the design key is all about and how it can be achieved. The change context is contextualised in relation to the trans-theoretical model of behaviour change and which stage of change it's at and the process of change it relates to. And the definition of the psychological process is also in that change context. The design key is the summary of what designing for each psychological process involves in terms of game design goals as well as how these goals can be achieved through design. Designer prompt is the summary of game design pattern categories and it's framed as a question in order to facilitate game design teams going through this iterative creative process and to question design ideas and design patterns that might give rise to the design goals of the key. So in addition to the 10 change keys, there's also 19 key considerations which fall broadly under these three categories. There's overall development considerations, there's design processes which are a little bit more explicit about the design process, and then there's the design toolkit which helps you link back in with the Rosetta wheel and actually implement those design techniques. Um, so I won't go into detail about all of these because I think I'm just almost out of time, um, but these are kind of explained in a lot more detail in the paper, um, which you'll have access to. And I just want to give um, a moment to um, explain how the name came about. Um, so during the final game designer interview for this body of research, the conversation steered towards shared languages of design. It was the third section of the interview where the framework was introduced and the designer was explaining their design process when they said this quote. Um, just essentially saying that there's a lot of overlap 
It's just that we all speak different languages. So, you know, looking at the framework, it's like, oh, my gosh, it's the Rosetta Stone, you know. And uh, at that time, that's when the name was the, of the Rosetta Wheel was born. So the Rosetta Wheel essentially is a language translation tool. It provides a basis for game designers to understand psychological principles and apply them in their work. And likewise, it provides an insight for health professionals and subject matter experts in the game design processes, techniques and terminology. It's a tool that has been developed um, with designing in mind, but it can equally be used as a foundation for analysis or a guide for post-development evaluation. The Rosetta Wheel is not an all-encompassing framework that attempts to summarise and communicate every aspect of psychology and game design in a prescriptive, reductive or conclusive way. Um, rather, it's a starting point, like the Rosetta Stone, to begin to understand some of the more meaningful concepts in the psychology of behaviour change and how these concepts can link to and be applied to game design processes. And the goal is for this framework to be a useful guide for future collaborative work in the field of designing games for positive health change. And I'll just finish off now with a brief example of a game called BreathSync, which I was recently involved in alongside a fantastic team um, called the Sun Chasers at the 2021, so this year, the Games for Change Festival in New York. Um, which was an online experience and it was part of the Brain Jam. So we actually won a special recognition award for research application for this game, um, which is a real, you know, tribute to the whole team and a tribute to um, the way that we were able to utilise biofeedback um, in this game and base it around something which is seemingly very simple, which is our breath and teach people to, using biofeedback bio in a VR context, to actually engage in belly breathing um, because belly breathing is actually incredibly therapeutic and relaxing. And if we can master the skill of belly breathing, then that can really help address stress and anxiety at times. So that's what this game was about um, and it was essentially you put the controller on your belly and it was, um, it could pick up whether you, how deep your belly breaths were and the game modified itself accordingly. So it provided positive nudges within the game world to breathe deeply through these changes in the VR environment itself. We had a kind of a check-in survey and a check-out survey which uh, was all about your, um, your mental health at that time. And players could choose a variety of different environments from the forest to mountain to sea. This is the sea example, which is the one that we did as, as our prototype. Um, so, yeah, that was an example. And that absolutely incorporated several aspects of the Rosetta Wheel into its design principles, which... Um, yeah, I can certainly go into afterwards if you'd like. Um, but I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much for watching, um, coming to watch my talk. And please get in touch if you have any uh, questions or, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the framework. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.